ahead and call this meeting to order. The, now, the time is now 5.10 and the VIA Metropolitan Board of Trustees will call itself to order with a moment of reflection for our entire community. I'm going to ask our new president and CEO, Mr. Arndt, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Any announcements, Mr. Arndt? Okay. Sure, I'll move into the, my report. First of all, I'd like to announce that VIA received the Owner of the Year Award by the Hispanic Contractors Association. Uh, this award recognized VIA's investment in developing VIA Primo, the region's first bus rapid transit project, and our investment in the West Side Multimodal Transit Center. So that's a, a good local recognition that we received. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the wisdom of the San Antonio Express News, which recently published the list of the top 10 smartphones apps that were designed either by San Antonians or for San Antonio. And our new smartphone app, Go Via, Via, fits both of those parameters. It was developed by a San Antonian and for San Antonio, and it appeared on their top 10 list. Through the beginning of July, we've sold over 5,800 apps between iPhone and Android applications, and we've had over 130,000 requests for bus stop location information. Tim Porter, whose company AppDiction developed Go, Go, Go Via Via, was a big hit at the annual Amp, uh, Compto conference held last week in Florida, where he demonstrated the app to interested folks from around uh, the region, around the, the country, other interested transit properties. And so we, he may be developing more business, which is a great thing for a San Antonio company. Uh, VIA partnered on the 4th of July with the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce to shuttle active military personnel from Fort Sam and Kelly to the downtown fireworks display. The chamber uh, bought fair meeting to cover special event fairs for the folks. And we hope this is the first of a, a long-term relationship in serving our military Mil military personnel on July 4th. And lastly, uh, Charlie Gonzalez, our Chief of Public Engagement, Richard Martinez, one of his staff and I, I spent two days last week visiting our congressional delegation in Washington, D.C. The purpose of the trip was to introduce the delegation to, to me as the new President and CEO, uh, to discuss our TIGER application that's in process and to update them on our full capital program. Uh, we also dropped by to chat with FTA administrative, uh, administration uh, planning folks to tell them, update them on our capital program as well. And that's my report. Did you bring home a lot of money? We are uh, <laughs> hoping to begin that process. Okay, that brings us to item number four, citizens to be heard. I always know I'm in trouble when I have three members of the famous Cortez family in the audience, but um, we'll go ahead and get started anyway. Mr. Chairman, we have 18 citizens to be heard. As your name is called, you're welcome to come to the front to make your comments. If you'd rather make the comments from where you sit, please raise your hand as your name is called, and a microphone will be brought to you. Our first speaker has time yielded to him from two other speakers for a total of nine minutes. George Cortez. Thank you very much, um, Chairman Munoz and esteemed Board of Trustees. My name is Jorge Cortez for the record, and uh, I represent the uh, MTC Corporation in the Mercado Market Square area. Uh, my brother Ruben Cortez, uh, who um, runs Pico de Gallo on the other side across from UTSA, and my uh, nephew, Michael Cortez, who runs La Margarita uh, there in Market Square. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for the service that you give to us, to our beautiful city. Uh, we are appreciative uh, to you all. And I think this is a great project for San Antonio 
uh, I think we're taking it to the future and we're just delighted about it. I wanted to tell you a little history about our neighborhood, our area, in the west end of downtown. And the Cortez family is here and we've gotten together with a lot of the stakeholders, business leaders from our area, from our neighborhood. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Maria Ferrer with us, uh, representing Texas A&M, uh, the uh, educational uh, center and cultural center. Uh, Mr. Ernest Bromley, who is our chairman for the Alameda Theater, a very historical for the performing arts. We got uh, Mr. Ed Cross, who, uh, from the Vistana uh, Downtown Living, which we're so delighted about seeing people starting to live downtown. We got Mr. Lucan Gillinan that owns the Washington Square building uh, right across from La Margarita a Restaurant and, uh, and a gentleman that moved from Mexico, um, a very famous boutique uh, Marty's from Nuevo Laredo that has really added uh, to to the flavor of the Mercado. It's a um, little upper scale Mexican boutique. Very, very beautiful right across from the Penner's uh, uh, um, store. I just wanted to say the, the, the importance of our area. I was raised selling bananas on Produce Row. I saw my father come from Guadalajara, Mexico as an immigrant and um, started his restaurant with three tables. And at the age of 42, he bought the business block. Now, at that time, Ur Urban Renewal had a program and um, it was very progressive, trying to help the west end of downtown but many of the landmarks of the community were torn down. And at that time, our father stepped up to the plate and with the help of a lot of great leaders of San Antonio, convinced them the importance of preserving the area, the importance of the heritage and the roots that were there. They could not be duplicated. They were real. Uh, I had an opportunity of visiting the, uh, the Alameda as a, as a young boy. It really helped me identify myself as a Mexican-American because at the time growing up, I didn't really understand whether I was Mexican or I was American, but the Alameda Theater certainly did help because walking in as a child the beauty of the theater uh, identified my culture as a beautiful culture and something that has to be preserved here in our city so having said that after our father passed away i wanted to put a vision together for my family first of all and then to bring it forth towards the, to the community. And that was more of a cultural zone, which we are calling Zona Cultural. And we started at Milam Park, the renovation. And in my heart, it was always the idea of the, the trips that I used to take to Mexico and see the families gather in the plazas. And even though they didn't have the money, that the children could play, there was a, a little playground for them to play. And I, I really felt that it was important to expand the vision that my father had helped to preserve and that Mi Tierra Corporation and the Cortez family had to be more than just selling enchiladas, tacos, and tamales. That it had to have a greater meaning. And so, with that in mind, the renovation 
Dr. Orozco, Dr. Castaneda from the Santa Rosa Hospital, we came together and, and we raised money for the renovation of the park. Of course, the, the Alameda Theater was one of the most important ones that we wanted to save. And so we got very involved in, in, in helping the Alameda. Then the public art came along and we kind of teamed with uh, Jesse Trevino and worked to help him establish that beautiful mural on Santa Rosa Hospital. I want to start summing up because I see the, I have only two, two minutes left. I didn't think, uh, I thought I could say a lot more. But we're very excited about uh, the alternative routes and we really feel that we, we need to be included. It's, it's, it's a historical area. It's developing more. Uh, we got the new children's uh, uh, hospital in Santa Rosa. Uh, we, we have the San Pedro Creek that's being developed. Um, we're looking forward to uh, Texas A&M, uh, the Henry Ford uh, School of Design, which is going to be housed at the Alameda. All of these different projects, along with the downtown living, uh, they're coming along. And I think that for the ridership, and for the economic development, I think it is important. Um, one of the things, projects that is coming up, hopefully soon, is uh, the new federal courthouse, which be adjacent to the San Pedro Creek. And um, I, I guess the San Pedro Creek, if you, I don't know if you guys have seen the plans, but they are beautiful to be almost like the San Pedro River. So, at any rate, uh, did I miss anything? Just don't leave us out. Uh, I think, you know, I, I know there's been a lot of plans and I know it's difficult uh, for, for you all to come t and make everybody happy. But I think that it is very important for, for the future of our city that we don't lose the authenticity, the, the roots that are there, that was really what Pedro Cortez, our father, stood for. And, uh, and they're alive, they're still alive. Through our selling of enchiladas, tacos, and tamales, we've been able to participate with the leadership of San Antonio. And, and we feel that this, these pamphlets or handouts that we gave you it's just a few of the beautiful um, treasures that San Antonio has. Uh, thank you very much for your time. God bless you all. Thank you. Javier Gonzalez. Good afternoon, Chairman Munoz, distinguished members of the board, uh, and hardworking members of the staff. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Javier Gonzalez. I am a principal with WRZG Architecture, along with my, my partners Raul Reyes and Bob Wise. Uh, we, uh, we're residents in the cultural zone, in the Zona Cultural. We chose our office and our home to be in this area uh, because of its steep history. Uh, and as much as it, that's important, also for our vision to the future. This is a space and a place that is the heart of San Antonio. San Antonio has the, uh, its roots at the uh, main plaza and its rebirth uh, with the Mexican Revolution in 1910. That brought in uh, a, a, you know, so many immigrants in, into our city that give it its culture and flavor that we still enjoy to this day. The second revolution, if you will, is this one here today with the streetcar, with the routes that you're looking at. Certainly uh, have a strong appreciation for what uh, you're weighing before you. It's wonderful on all sides. We support you know, the routes that take you to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west. Uh, be sure that as you move forward with your, with your decisions that you don't leave out the Zona Cultural. If I'm not mistaken, option five seems to skirt uh, option five, touching nearly everything else. So with that, you know, we, we ask that you lovingly uh, and nostalgically look uh, to the cultural zone but also look with a vision to, to the future. You know, the cultural zone has had uh, you know, many, many great 
uh, aspects of it of investment here recently uh, with uh, as you heard earlier the, the potential for the new federal courthouse the children's uh, hospital certainly UTSA has their master plan and now that uh, it seems that better times are around the corner we may see some investment from the state uh, therein uh, we've got the cathedral we've got the Vistana we've got so much uh, it wasn't uh, even 12 months ago we had Ken Salazar come to the uh, Secretary of Interior come to the cultural zone to see for himself what true culture is all about in San Antonio. So with that, uh, I urge you to not leave us out and thank you for your hard work. Dr. Maria Hernandez Ferrier. Chairman Munoz and esteemed members of this hardworking VIA board. My name is Maria Hernandez Ferrier and I am the president of Texas A&M University San Antonio and now a new resident at Market Square. <coughs> Last fall, our university became the newest residence at this beautiful and historic downtown with the acquisition of the former Alameda, Museo Alameda. Our educational and cultural arts center will do more than tell the story of the Latino experience. It will change lives. It will make dreams come true. It will bring a community together. Like the history of Market Square, it promises to bring people from all walks of life. Students, faculty, the young and the old, children, their parents and their grandparents, all sharing its rich culture. We stand with Teatro Alameda, Milam Park, the Children's Hospital, the Spanish Governor's Palace, and so many others, businesses and redevelopment projects to showcase this area. In fact, it is our duty to make this city proud. The power of VIA's modern streetcar project will be magical. We're here to ask to make sure that the Zona Cultural and the Greater Market Square is given the opportunity to be part of this magic. Thank you. Ernest Bromley. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Board. Good to see you all th this afternoon. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Alameda Theater as well as a, I'm also a downtown employer of Bromley Communications down on Houston Street. And uh, the Alameda Theater is in restoration. I, well, I chair the nonprofit. We will, we're looking to open the theater, reopen it really in, in spring of 2015. And this whole West End that Jorge and Maria have been talking about is, is something that I think is really integral to the tourism aspect of our city as well as our employees and residents that live downtown to make sure that streetcar clearly has a route that runs through the center of town down Commerce Street, east west, to, to connect up with what you're doing route on Broadway, which I think is also critical. So it's to me in terms of, of the ultimate design, because the two routes that I've seen so far, you're not on Commerce or Human or Houston Street. And I think that's a, extremely important for moving people back and forth. If you think about it, there's three and a half million people visit the Market Square every year. And that's just the second largest tourism attraction in, in the city. And so, uh, so really it's something that we need to keep in mind and so forth. I know you do end it there, but you gotta run that east-west corridor. Thank you very much. Lori Zertucci. Uh, yes, my name is Laurie Zertucci. Um, I just wanted to, I'm one of the testers for the technology on the phone for VO Trans. And when I booked my reservations, um, after I enter the day and the time that I want my reservations, and it tells you, you, you will be called a day before, and then you enter more. Then after that, it's silence, and uh, I have to call back to confirm my reservations because it doesn't say your booking trip was a success or denied or anything. You just don't hear anything, so you have to call back to confirm. Even though you hit start, even though you hit um, pound one to to go back to the main menu, you don't get anything. So. <laughs> I was just wondering if somebody could probably 
listen with me as I go through the steps and they'll know that um, nothing happens. And another thing is, um, we're still, I work at the Lighthouse for the Blind in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, we have the 34 and the 42 that come and pick us up to go downtown. Uh, Thursday the 18th, it, it, it either showed up late or it didn't show up, but we're still having problems with that 34 um, two days a week. But the lighthouse is now part of the sequestration, so we've been working four days a week, so I don't know what happens Friday. Fridays, but Thursdays, you know, the, it still comes late or probably doesn't show up either. And thank you. Larry Johnson. Uh, okay. Um, I'm sorry I only have two copies, so the chairman and the president went out. Uh, um, what I'm going to share with you are some numbers, and what I want to really talk about is the future the future. What will be the demand for Via Trans service 15 years from now? And how will it meet that demand? The Bayer County population in 2012, according to the U.S. Census, was 1.78 million. 10.9% or 194,000 of these uh, residents are people over the age of 65, like Bill and me. The number of seniors will increase by 60% over the next 15 years, raising the number of 65 and older people in Bear County to <clears throat> 310,000 by 2028. Now, one in four people over the age of 65 has a disability. And this increases as people get older. For example, for people over the age of 80, it's 7 out of 10. But taking the lower number, if we will, of 1 out of 4, we're looking at around 78,000 people over the age of 65 who have a disability by the year 2028. What percentage of these will need via trans service? Now, going back to our original population figures of Bayer County of 1.78 million, the U.S. Census estimates that 19% of these have some sort of disability. That's about 338,000. Well, let's say that 90% of these choose not to use Viatran or don't need to use Viatran. That still leaves almost 34,000, and that's today. What about 15 years from now? VIA currently serves on their registry 13,000. So we have to look at the future. There needs to be a long-range plan. Just as there is a long-range plan for VIA, there needs to be a long-range plan for VIA Trans Service. And I would propose to this board that you establish an ad hoc committee of board members, management staff, and citizens or passengers of VIA Trans to really begin planning and looking to the future. Thank you. Lucan Gilliland. Mr. Chairman, board members, VIA staff, uh, I'm Luke and Gilliland, Jr. I'm here representing the owners of the Washington Square Office Building, which is just south of uh, the Meteora Complex. Just here to re reiterate what others have said about the Zona Cultural and to let you know that we uh, strongly support the efforts of the Cortez family's uh, efforts to uh, preserve the rich cultural heritage in this city. Uh, hope that you won't forget the uh, a number of visitors that come, 3.4 million every year to the uh, Meteor uh, area, the, the Mercado area. I think it would greatly enhance our the efforts of this group to uh, make the ridership a issue a success. Thank you very much. Ferris Hodge. All right. <clears throat> Can y'all hear me? They got a song called On the Road Again, so I think I'm on the road again. 
First, I want to thank Via for giving me the backup documents that I was asking for uh, at the last meeting because y'all was in violation of the Texas Social Meetings Act. We have a right to read what y'all have before y'all actually vote on it. And I was going to talk to Frank and Bonnie about it, but I got a letter in the mail three days ago, all the backup information that I needed. And that, that information is very important that we have um, to, to, uh, to see what y'all talking about and not talking about. So I want to thank y'all for that. Now, um, I know y'all heard about a bus driver went to sleep at the wheel this morning and ran into two or three cars. I'm sure y'all heard about it. And what a tragedy. Uh, I don't think the drivers get enough sleep at all, to be truthful with you. Because a lot of time I see them sitting up there Norton. But I figure, well, you know, maybe they drink some coffee. Y'all won't let nobody drink no coffee on the bus or nothing like that. And that, that would help the drivers if they could drink coffee on the bus or anything like that. Now, uh, as far as the drivers uh, speaking to us, it's a little bit better. But I told the, the director of the bus drivers that they had said that he said that if they talked to the people too long, they were going to get ridden up. Now, people that you've been knowing 25 or 30 years, you need to talk to them more than five minutes, okay? Now, I said once before, they need to say good morning, hello, or kiss my foot. And I was talking to one of the drivers said she talk to the driver sometimes, they won't say nothing. They won't say hello, good, mo good morning, or kiss my foot. Now we get that old saying from our grandfather, every time a baby was born, he would kiss the baby's foot, in case y'all wanna know where that word come from. And my grandmother would kiss the baby's foot. That give them good luck. So that's gonna be my motto the rest of this year, kiss my foot. And I wanna say to the board, uh, y'all's employees have not got a pay raise the ones that retire and shame on you. The new, the, the new board don't know anything about it, so, you know, they don't know. And I, I, and I know that Mr. Art got his bonus and pay raise. That's good. I'm not knocking that, Mr. Art. But y'all need to look back at y'all's employees that have, have been here for years, and they worked hard, they got cussed out, they got talked about, drew a, some people might threw a rock at them and hit them upside the head. They went through all this trauma. And a long time ago, they didn't have no radios on the bus. They are the backbone of VIA. And I want VIA to, to, to pay them 15 and a half cents. You're going to say, well, Ferris, tell me something. Where are we going to get it from? The fare box. Y'all going to take $195 million and put it on that streetcar downtown, which is don't make any sense at all. That's not counting the interest. That's not counting how much you already have. Then the last thing. Uh, the advertisement. That's where the money should come. So, Mr. Hart, I'm going to have to have a meeting with you and, and then the chairman, okay? And uh, y'all hang in there, okay, because I will be around. Willie May Clay. Good evening. My name is Willie May Clay, and uh, I am a user of both paratransit, via trans, and uh, mainline bus. I'm here today to talk about basically two things. But before I get into the purpose of my my presentation, I, I want to thank VIA, specifically the paratransit staff, for holding another excellent workshop. The workshop was held on Saturday the 20th. And my, I must admit, that these workshops are not only informative, but they're being much improved in that we, the staff, is permitting a lot of interaction between them and the participants. And it appears that more people are attending, so that says a lot. And I also want to thank you for feeding us. You did it again. You fed us. So I, I appreciate that. Going on to my purpose of being here today. You will hear before you today a presentation, I believe, from the paratransit staff asking you to accept a policy of the 1020 program. Now, the 1020 program is one in which via has, or the Via Trans staff, 
is saying that as of the 23rd of December, if the van were to come 10 minutes prior to your negotiated pickup time, you must get on the van. If the van does arrive 10 minutes prior to, the driver starts counting down the five minutes. And then in the other end, the 20 minutes is we allow the driver to, to run 20 minutes late if he's not able to get there at the negotiated time. <coughs> now that's the 1020 proposition. My concern is that this was put into place as a pilot program from the 23rd of December until I guess they told us, I think they told us up until May. That's what they told us at the last workshop. But the recent workshop, they said they're gonna bring a proposal to you that you approve it. Well, do you know? Anything that's pilot, you're testing it. You're gonna see how it works. Well, during this period, from December until now, the staff has been maintaining a list that staff felt persons were in violation in terms of penalties. And in my opinion, I understand the persons have penalties, but I really feel that if this were a piloted program, I felt that persons should not have been penalized for this new program that was starting. But they were being penalized, and yet they were being taken off the program. I Our mean, next the speaker has time yielded to him from one other speaker. Off the service. So I'm asking that the, that the staff look at that list of persons that, that were being penalized. and see if something can be done in terms of fairness. Ed I, Cross. I want the staff to look at that. Okay? Thank you very much. Ed Cross has six minutes. Uh, Chairman Munoz and other members, thank you uh, for your service. Uh, before I talk about the streetcar, I do want to compliment you on something. Um, there's a, a man who is 64 years old. His name is Dennis Jones. He's been a lifetime resident of Mission Road. Uh, he has cerebral palsy. He attends church at First Presbyterian Church downtown. And he is the most reliable attendee at First Pres in the last 20 years. He's missed five Sundays in 20 years. He gets there via, via trans. And y'all do a tremendous service to him to take him to church and back every Sunday. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm also Dennis's legal guardian, and I stand on the curb with him every Sunday waiting for the bus. And I can't tell you how pleased I am when that bus is right on time. So thank you for what y'all do. I stand today with the Cortez family. I stand proudly with George and his family in support of a streetcar route that will go by the cultural zone and by the Mercado. Uh, later today you're going to see a version that is described as version 7. That is a couplet that runs up market and commerce. When you see that uh, plan, I'd like you to take into consideration the following. The two biggest tourist uh, destinations in San Antonio are the Alamo and the Mer uh, Mercado. All your other versions don't run by those two. The, the version 7 will at least come close to them and provide the tourist uh, traffic a means of accessing them. It will also co go by the corner of Hemisphere Park and Hemisphere Park is very important and I think that is important to connect. Finally, one of the con considerations of staff for the streetcar uh, alignment is uh, going by potential development sites and I want to assure you that there is lots of development sites along that version 7. Uh, in fact, in the immediate area around the Mercado, we've identified four sites to build an additional thousand units of housing. So in, in your analysis, you try to see where there are riders and you try to see where there is future development opportunities. 
And I would suggest to you that version 7 that you'll see later uh, checks both of those boxes. Again, thank you for your service. Thank you for your consideration. And uh, I look forward to your vote. Robert Camarino. Mr. Chairman, members of the board and staff, my name is Robert Camarino. I'm the interim city manager of and representing the city of New Braunfels here this evening. Uh, we ap appreciate your consideration of agenda item number nine uh, this evening, as well as the cooperative relationship that we have developed with you and your staff as we work towards a solution for the continuation of very much needed transportation services that are provided in our community. Uh, I'll be here this evening to answer any questions that you may have as you consider this item. Thank you. Shelley McMullen. Good evening. I want to share a personal story with you this evening. Um, okay, thanks. But I have to I have to explain the situation before I can give you the real why I'm actually speaking. On February the 16th of this year, my husband and I were walking downtown, and I took a big old tumble. I tripped and I fell and broke broke my right shoulder, and have been in recovery for that. And I, I'm at the in the final stages of physical therapy right now. And for those of you that don't know, you go, where's her dog? Well, I don't have my dog anymore because the school where my dog was trained chose to force me to sign her over to them because my recovery is six months. And they just said they didn't feel we'd be a safe team any longer after that. So I will be getting another dog, but I don't know when, I don't know where, and I don't know what dog. But I know one thing, it won't be that school. But on to the reason I'm speaking is I want the board to know that I so much appreciate the way that the drivers, all of the drivers that I've ridden with on paratransit have treated me since my accident because I have, have had to tell them up front, I no longer have a guide dog. I need more assistance and I need even more assistance than normal because of my shoulder. I can't put on my own seatbelt and all that sort of thing. That's pretty much over. But the, the drivers have been just very courte courteous about all of this and very accommodating, which has made life easier for me going to all my therapy and other doctor's appointments. And I can tell you this has been the hardest six months of my life, and I'm thankful that it's almost over. And on another note, I want to say thank you to the Star Shuttle staff for sending me a very encouraging card while I was in recovery. Thank you. Maria Moreno. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maria Moreno. I work at the Lighthouse of San Antonio. Um, one of the things that I want to bring up is that um, I ride the via trans and the buses, the buses a lot. I'd like to see us get seatbelts on these buses because there are times when they have to stop suddenly on, these, on their brakes. I guess someone cuts in front of them, you know, a car or, or a truck, I don't know, or people are walking in the street. I, w I would like to know when and if we could get some seat, you know, seat belts on the buses at some point in time. We do have them on via trans, and that's that's great, but I like it on the buses as well. And I do. I also believe that the streetcar thing that y'all voted for, y'all passed or whatever I want. I think it's going to create a lot of chaos because I'm, I mean I know you're right. The tourists they're here, and it's you know it brings money to San Antonio, whatever. But um, it's just going to create chaos for the people that live here in San Antonio. We already have the buses, you know, that take us from point A to point B. Anyway, thank you very much. Joe McMullen. Thank you, I'm, uh, I'm Joe McMullen, uh, Silly's other half. And I just wanted to, uh, and I'm, I work at the Lighthouse for the Blind. I'm also a uh, member of the Elmo Council of the Blind. And I just wanted to uh, talk about the the buses <coughs> on uh, number 42 and the 34 that Laurie mentioned earlier. Um, the 34, I understand, is there's a one at 
420, I think, or 424 that's supposed to come into the lighthouse. The one right before that is supposed to go toward town. Well, uh, sometimes on Thursday and Friday, or well, just about every week it happens that neither bus come in, comes into the lighthouse. Uh, there's uh, not until after 4.30. 4.35 sometimes it's, uh, one time it's five o'clock before it, any, any bus got there. So I'd, uh, I just wondered uh, what's going on. Sometimes we call in and ask them where the bus is and they'll say something like, uh, well, that bus is over there at uh, uh, Goliad and, and um, uh, Goliad and some street, <laughs> uh, military somewhere over there. And uh, so I don't know what's going on with that. But anyway, I'd like to see something like that. But anyway, I'd, I would like to say that uh, I appreciate uh, all that Viatran, the, uh, uh, the Viatran's uh, uh, operators d do for us and, and, uh, and the city buses. Because uh, without them, uh, we'd, we'd, be in a, we'd be in bad shape. <laughs> Thank you so much. James Rodarte. Uh, good afternoon, via board members. Uh, my name is James Rodarte, and I uh, represent Train Delays Incorporated. We're changing tracks for a positive move forward. As you've heard me before in the past, I've come here and uh, talked to you about train delays off of uh, Sarsamota and Friel City Road. That intersection is uh, very congested with trains. 2,200 commuters cross the intersection daily and uh, are stopped anywhere from 15 to 90 minutes at any given time. The Eagle Ford, Shell, Port San Antonio, and Toyota have contributed to increased train travel at this intersection. Re uh, reports indicate that travel, I mean train travel, will increase in the near future. Walmart will be constructing a new store about eight blocks from this, this intersection and will add to the congestion. Train delays cause riders to be late to their jobs, medical appointments, transfer points. Students are late to area schools and universities, uh, which include Palo Alto and uh, Texas A&M. Regular and uh, overtime pay for bus operators must add up. I don't know if you've ever uh, done the figures. Fuel waste and pollutions add to the CDCPA problem when buses are stopped. Uninterrupted access across rail lines uh, is needed in order to accommodate any BRT service in the future. We need uh, infrastructure or transportation improvements in that area in order for that uh, particular area to grow. Ultimately, it's the city's uh, responsibility to initiate uh, the project in order to move forward. We have asked the city, the county, and the state to support funding and an over, an over or underpass. It all seems to, they all seem to agree that it is needed. It is up to us to support this initiative. SAISD, Port San Antonio, your local ATU 694, and area neighborhood associations have already adopted a resolution to support this initiative. I am asking that this board adopt a resolution to help support or improve transportation at this intersection. Thank you. There are no more citizens to be heard. At this time, we're going to skip ahead to item number six, which is via trans trip reservations and scheduling. Um, Alva Carrasco will be presenting that. My name is Alva Carrasco. I'm the Vice President of Transportation. Sitting on my left is Sylvia Castillo, our new Manager of Paratransit Operations. It's good to see some familiar faces. Today we're going to present our information regarding our new Via Trans Reservations window. The new pickup window, which we call the 1020 minute, pickup window was first introduced back in December at a Via Trans workshop. We've also have informed our Via Trans clientele at two other workshops since then, the last one being this past Saturday, July the 20th. 
The test period began in January of this year and VIA staff has been monitoring the effects of the new procedure. During our test period, we have decreased the number of no-shows an average of 6% from January through May. Thank you. No-shows, no penalties have decreased an average of 14% from the period of January through May. And I also wanted to mention that Viatrans did not penalize any customers that did not comply with the new pickup window during the test period. Was this an actual increase in the time that people are given to, we've changed the way we notify people, right? Correct. And, and now that they have that change in the notification system, is this an actual, is this less time or more time than they've had? It's actually from, we went from a 20 minute window to a 30 minute window. Okay. And I'll give a, a, a sam an example of how that works. Uh, in the current procedure, the customer is given a pickup time and the van is given 20 minutes to arrive from that negotiated pickup time. If that van is not there within 20 minutes, the customer will contact us and ask where the ride is. What's new in this procedure is the van can arrive up to 10 minutes early than the pickup time. The customer is given five minutes from the negotiated pickup time to board the van. And I'll give an example that will make it much more clear in the next slide. For example, the customer is given an 8.05 pickup time. The van may arrive a few minutes early but the actual pickup window begins at 7.55, the 10 minutes before the negotiated pickup time of 8.05. The customer from that point on is given five minutes to board the van to come out from their home. And once they come, they board, the van leaves. Now, if the van is, uh, the customer rather, is told the van will arrive between 7.55 and 8.25. So they're told basically to be ready even if the van is there 10 minutes early. Once the pickup window ends at 8.25 in this case, then at 8.26 the van would be considered late and the customer would do what they normally do and call us back to ask where the ride is. Does that make sense? Um, following board approval, we will be notifying all of our VIA trans customers of the new 10, 20 minute pickup window with the official start date, which we would like to implement on September 1st. And again, VIA trans will continue to monitor the progress of the program and the effects. At this point, we've seen good results as far as productivity. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn the meeting over to, to uh, Gerald Lee because I think he and his colleagues on the Ad Hoc Accessible uh, Transportation Committee have maybe some answers I'm looking for, so. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, this was at, uh, it's uh, Chairman uh, Bill Martin uh, was his first meeting, but I've chaired the Ad Hoc Transportation Committee for some years. And this was an issue when it came before uh, the Ad Hoc Committee that we felt it would be important to uh, bring before the entire board, um, particularly because th there are some changes that are being made that impact um, uh, our ridership, uh, particularly our disabled ridership. and. Uh, uh, it, it helped me out here with some of the questions, but this, you all did work in tandem in discussions with a lot of the paratrans ridership? That's correct, yes. In fact, we, we saw that um, customers are usually out there earlier than they're expected to be. So it, there was very little effect as far as uh, complaints or any negative impacts. And 
and the numbers that you showed uh, on the slide and also showed to us at the uh, ad hoc uh, accessible transportation committee showed there has actually been a decrease in no shows if I'm not correct that's correct the the other thing was uh, as as for those who aren't uh, as knowledgeable dealing with uh, paratransit scheduling is quite challenging so by adding from a 20 minute to a 30 minute window adding just this 10 extra minutes is it increasing the efficiency of our uh, scheduling yes do you want to speak a little bit about that? It does improve our on-time performance. It helps us to, to stay on time to pick up the next customers. It, it, it elaborates, so it also assists also those people, not just the person you're picking up, but as you're moving right, on down the line. further down the line, because most of the time, people are coming out early, so that assists us later on when we have issues like accidents, uh, construction that we're facing to get to the next ride on time, to pick up the next customer. Because once you have one customer or an accident or incident, it makes the rest of the trips late. So this improves our efficiency. And uh, the other thing is, in on the outreach to our ridership, um, and the number, excuse me, but I usually know the number of our uh, paratransit ridership, but all of them were contacted. They received a letter in December of 2012 notifying them of the program and the test part the testing of this and and during the during the test uh during the pilot program were there any penalties no no penalties they were not giving any pen right. penalties mm -hmm. for this program they weren't there were there were no shows the regular well, it, usual well, yeah it, it would if it was yeah. a penal it, it, here's the question with if you could still have a no-show if you still didn't meet the requirements the of window. paratransit, right. uh, the, the current guidelines. Correct. That is correct. Well, we but did not penalize anybody for this program. So can I just go back and ask some questions? So in the three and a half years I've sat in this chair, I hear three things, right? The first thing I think we've resolved, which is the notification system by which people used to receive a phone call right now that's changed we implemented a new system so that seems to have gotten better right. yeah, we're at about 95 percent there the second the second issue is not your convenience but the convenience or the inconvenience to the rider when um, when when our van or a star shuttle van shows up at their house and it's difficult for them to get in or to, to make their way to the van the amount of time that they're given or the weather conditions necessary right. you know for them to be exposed to the element right. and so that's the second the third is the issue of routing or scheduling right how these vans are routed so that something that should take this amount of time actually takes that amount of time are you set a, uh, give me just tell me how that is working now and then I think Willie May said that there was another forum with the community and are they on board? Is there some level of consensus that we're moving in the right direction? Um, was, this, was this the focus of that? And can I add one other thing? I, in addition to the, a couple things also, when it, that they're not required to be outside. Uh, our ridership is not required to be outside waiting because uh, I, I think there's some confusion on the board. And so if you could elaborate on that and also about the no, five minutes. It's that people have a difficult time making their way outside well, in the window. Right, as they're walking to the van, I mean, if Not they need confused. assistance, the thing is there's an assist a door uh, program where customers, some customers already, we already have it on file that they need assistance from the door to the van. We assist them. That doesn't, that, I mean, it may take us five minutes. It takes us sometimes five minutes to load a wheelchair. So it does take a little time. Um, but we also, uh, if they need assistance at the, at the door or when they come out, we provide that as well. They'll just need to let the driver know, I need some assistance coming to the van. So we provide that. Now, um, we do stay. Uh, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address your issue about whether things have improved. So for the past uh, six years, every day I look at the paratransit daily report that comes out. 
gives on-time performance, it gives denials, it gives a whole, you know, a whole slew of information. And when I started, uh, our on-time performance was in the low 80s, the productivity is 1.7, 1.6 passengers per hour. Uh, denials were in the 7 to 8 percent range. Today, routinely, I open it up, denials are in the single digits, not single digit percent, single digit number of denials, 7, 6, 5, well less than 1 percent. On-time performance is 86 to 88 uh, percent. Our productivity is above budget. That's why we're, uh, our expenses are below budget because our productivity is 5 to 6 percent above budget. It's 1.88 passengers per hour in that neighborhood. So uh, that's been a result of a lot of different uh, programs that Mary, Gerald, Mr. Martin, and others who have served uh, on the ad hoc committee and the other members have helped us implement and have uh, what I think have brought us to the precipice of being one of the best paratransit systems in the country. And that's what we tell our customers every time we go to a workshop we're going to be the best paratransit system in the country and I think we're getting there and I think um, a lot of these programs this particular policy uh, has also helped has contributed uh, to that improvement and so I would urge the board to uh, approve the resolution thank you so let me say thank you to our board members and to the community for making their voices heard because I think only in that ecology of people speaking back and forth in an open and frank manner can things improve at, to this level. It sounds like then the only issue that is hanging, and maybe not the only issue, but an issue that's still hanging out there that I hear about is the qualification or requalification of people's, uh, right? I may not be getting the term right, but certification. the certification, certification. That, and, and having to recertify people. And, and that is one of the items that we are also going to be looking at reviewing and how You'll we bring can that back to the board yes sir soon mm -hmm. okay any more questions i do also want to thank uh, mr Lee. Uh, uh, there's a uh, uh, larry johnson there still still younger than bill martin but uh, i want to thank him also for being quite active on the ad hoc accessible committee and believe it or not, uh, having no problem uh, sharing his feelings and uh, expressing what his thoughts are so that there's been a great uh, give and take uh, on the committee. Thank you. Do I have a motion to, to approve? So move. I have a motion and a second. By, motion by Mr. Lee and a second by Mrs. Persenio. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you all. Thank you. Item number seven, short-term capital program update. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Good evening, and we're going to be uh, brief. Priscilla is going to give you the, the greater details on what has transpired in the past, because actually there was a discussion a few months ago, and then going forward, based on what we uh, were told at one of the, I think, uh, executive committee meetings. Uh, but what I wanted to preface everything was that we're going to be moving forward with the Westside Multimodal Center and its naming and branding in accordance with the discussion that was had this morning by the board uh, at the workshop, which is going to be very important. Second, we're very cognizant that the Westside Multimodal Center is one of our prime assets as we move forward with the rebranding and the naming of facilities. And with that, I will turn it over to Priscilla for the background and then going forward with a suggested timeline. Thank you. In your packet is a memo that outlines a discussion we had had with community stakeholders several months ago to begin to get a feel for people's feelings towards the facility and what we're moving forward with. So. What you have outlined in the memo are some key takeaways from that conversation where people told us um, some things they wanted us to remember about the facility if we were to move forward with some kind of branding or renaming and that was to position the facility as a cultural asset to make sure the project reflected a spirit of inclusion diversity and centrality and also that it functioned as an aesthetically pleasing magnetic destination that would draw 
both residents and visitors to a very friendly and approachable um, facility. Attached with that is an outline that um, that co communicates what our timeline is for getting this project done beginning um, this summer and then culminating in May with a public announcement and unveiling of a name and a brand identity for the facility. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have regarding this matter. Good afternoon. Good Ms. afternoon. Engel, is May the soonest you think we would be prepared to entertain a branding for the website? We might be able to move it up a little uh, more. When we presented this to the committee, we really had it done um, late summer, but we shaved some time off of that to get it done sooner. If we're, as we go through the process, if we feel that we can save some time and some of the outreach with stakeholders and, get, and getting their feedback and then developing the identity plan then we will we will keep that in mind and try to do it quicker thank you, thank you mr chairman are we, are we talking about may of next year yes it's a the long spring. time yeah, but she's announced it in may we need to know it it, it does seem that way so as i mentioned to mr miller is that as we go through this process if we can shore up some of the steps within the process and get it done sooner we will certainly do that that's a long time reflects what I said in committee. Pardon? It reflects what I said in committee. It's I think time. you need to go back and re and take a second look at that schedule. That is a really long time to come up with an identity program. And so I don't know how you do it. I'm not, but it's a really long time. <laughs> well, we probably can come up this morning in the, the discussion we had about the overall branding and, and naming of facilities and such. We can shorten that time and try to accomplish all those particular steps uh, as far as the outreach and, and getting the feedback that would be necessary. And then in, whether this is a facility that it lends itself to some of the naming opportunities that were discussed at the workshop this morning. But we can get it done in a shorter period of time and we will report back. I'm confident that we can bring it in by the end of the calendar year. Thank you. Is that it? Anybody, ha anybody else have questions? Great, thank you very much, we appreciate that. Item number eight, modern streetcar update, Mr. Buchanan. Good evening, Chairman and members of the board. Um, joining me this evening is Kyle Cahey with our program manager with HNTB and Jason Rodriguez, um, our streetcar project manager planner in my division. Um, this evening, we wanted to give you an update on where we stand as we move forward with the um, selection of a locally preferred alternative. Um, we are still on schedule to make that selection here at the end of August. Um, but tonight we wanted to focus on the market commerce east-west alignment and bring this up to the same level of detail that we've briefed you on, on on some of the other alternatives. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle um, to give the presentation. I'll be happy to help answer any questions. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Pleasure to be back here. We're getting to the close to the end of our, our path here. Uh, we wanted to take a few minutes and catch you up on our progress. Uh, there's four major areas I want to cover tonight. Just a quick recap of some of the recent activities that we've had. Uh, the results of the detailed screening, which includes the request that we had last month about looking at market and commerce. And then we'll talk about some of the responses to the board questions that we also fielded from you all uh, last month. And then at the very end, we'll talk just briefly a little bit about our schedule moving forward through the end of August, as Brian suggested. Uh, just to recap again, uh, y'all hosted uh, in June, uh, June 17th precisely, a public forum uh, with the community, um, being able to invite uh, the public to provide input and comments on the progress that we were making uh, at, at that time and at that time we were evaluating six alternatives we'll talk about two additional alternatives on market commerce tonight but we had a, a, a good uh, response a tremendous amount of interest in the project and uh, we did in fact record the questions and comments that we received from the public at that public forum 
we have prepared responses to those comments and responses and we are putting the, the final polish on that. We will have that submitted to you by the end of this week for your review and comment to make sure that those are acceptable to you before we post those and make those responses available to the public. But there's a very in, important uh, milestone for us uh, in the progress was to be able to get those comments uh, from the public and we look forward to your input uh, as we polish those efforts. Last month, if you'll recall, um, we did give you the preliminary uh, results of our analysis. There are two major concerns that we've been highlighting over the last several months, and that was concerns with the alignments that ran in front of the Alamo and Alamo Plaza, as well as the alignments that ran through Hemisphere Park. Based on uh, the input w that we received uh, and our evaluation results, we offered the recommendation to the board last month about eliminating those alignments that would go in front of Alamo Plaza or go through Hemisphere Park. So in essence, that removes uh, four alternatives, alternatives one, two, three, and four from further consideration. And you haven't made that final action yet, but that is a pending recommendation in front of you uh, that we wanted to make sure that we uh, uh, recapped that with you as well. So also it last month, uh, and it also this came up in the public forum and our public meeting that we've meetings that we've had. We have been asked to re-examine the market commerce alignment as a possible uh, location for the streetcar uh, option. And y as you'll recall, we had identified market commerce as a potential high capacity transit corridor for future transit services, and. Uh, it, as we had highlighted and noted with you, the elimination of the Alamo Street in particular uh, created an unintended consequence that we weren't serving some of the eastern downtown areas. And so this uh, request from you all came up to, t to address that unintended consequence. Let's take a look at market commerce. Let's see if in fact there is value in doing that. And so we're going to be presenting the results of that analysis for you tonight as we're um, introducing market commerce to the same type of analysis that we've done on the other alignment alternatives. Question. Yes, sir. Mr. Miller. On the commerce, thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the Commerce Street uh, evaluation, you're aware that the city is reluctant to go two-way Commerce Street from Bowie to 37. And that's why they're bringing it through bringing a connection from market over to Commerce Street at St. Paul Square. If you were to align or agree to an alignment of, of running streetcar down Commerce Street, there's no way to get across the railroad tracks past St. Paul Square. That is correct. That's that one of our concerns. So that would concern us that the east side, that, that would basically be the limit of where we could go when it comes to the east side unless we go underneath the uh, past the Robert Thompson Center. Is that not right? Uh, that's correct. Further in the presentation, we do address that specific issue as we move forward. So um, we'll be happy to discuss um, extension to the further east side as part of that conversation. Hey, it is my understanding that we do intend to extend the streetcar to the AT&T Center eventually. Yes, there are several extensions um, being considered, and that is uh, absolutely one of them that is under consideration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So with respect to the request to evaluate market commerce, I wanted to introduce to you on the same type of graphic that we've prepared the alignment drawings. This is what alternative seven uh, looks like on a similar type of uh, graphic that we've depicted alternatives one through six. Uh, as you can see, we go from west side all the way to uh, the Robert Thompson Center, and I'll correct that in just a minute. Um, uh, along market commerce. We actually don't go to Robert Thompson. That is one of the differences here. We would actually go to Sunset Station. And in just a minute, I do want to address that question about further extensions to the east because we, we might a we have an alternative that actually does drop down to Robert Thompson. So this is what Alternative 7 looks like. The, the key thing I do want to point out is that the north-south alignment along Broadway, Alamo, and St. Mary's excuse me, Broadway and St. Mary's Navarro uh, does remain consistent here. So this is uh, alternative seven. We did add alternative eight to the mix, which is going to change just a little bit. That is essentially uh, the Martin Pecan alternative. And instead of dropping all the way down to Cesar Chavez on the south side of the park, 
we, we tried to restore the market commerce alignment on the eastern end. So this, this doesn't fulfill what some would like to see of a continuous east-west alignment alternative, but we wanted to understand if there was any potential value of the east end on market commerce as well. So real quickly, I'm going to bounce off this real quick. This is my our Spumoni matrix uh, presentation that uh, kind of colorful, but I want to highlight to you real quickly. You've seen alternatives five and six, the top two lines. Take a look at seven and eight, and what you're going to see is there are some minor relative comparisons, differences, primarily the proximity to a, a sensitive areas. Um, uh, that is one thing that you're going to see on market and commerce. And then also we have a little bit uh, of an erosion of connection with the buses. The yellow is the no impact, pink is an, a negative impact, and green is a positive. Yeah, yellow is neutral, um, but it is slightly less positive than the green. Green is, is, is go, green is good, yellow is we have a little bit more of an impact, and red is where we start to get into some negative territory. Let me explain that on the following slide. This is where you can put some numbers to the pluses and minuses. Um, very importantly, on the cost category, the capital cost, what you're seeing is that alternatives seven and eight are generally competitive with alternative five. As you see a range of 201 to 228 for uh, alternative five, and we're in that same general ballpark for the capital costs associated with seven and eight. The pink box that we were just referring to that we were talking about the sensitive areas, in addition to uh, Milam Park and the Navarro Bridge, we are now going adjacent to the main military plazas. So that is an, an adjacency issue that we have to deal with from a Section 106 uh, and Section 4F uh, issue, historic properties and public parks. Uh, so that's kind of a, a, a bigger difference. The other, ca other factor I want to introduce to you is the column that addresses the ridership estimates. And again, a lot of this is about cost and it's about ridership. So on the ridership side of things, you're seeing that the market commerce alignments along number seven and eight have slightly less, about a 10% drop in ridership compared to alternative five. So the one thing that we are seeing uh, is, is kind of a, a quick early conclusion is there's not a significant difference, positive or negative. Uh, it's generally in the same ballpark as five. Um, there are some other things we'll present in just a minute that you will start to see some of those trade-offs uh, discussed, though. Do we have uh, that material in our uh, uh, online presently? Do we have that analysis in, in our presentation? It, which information? I'm sorry. This. This. No. I mean, could we? We we sort of need that, uh, as well as the, the the other breakdowns that we had. But uh, could you make sure that we get? Uh, this particular chart so that we can analyze it further. Very good, Absolutely. very good. Do you have uh, alternative six on uh, your slide of that? Do you have that on there? It's a oh. backup. Yeah. yeah, I also- Or all of them. Yeah, they do appear. We do have those. This is alternative five. Right, six I asked for. Six. This is six. And so what? So what drives the rider? The highest ridership was on six. What's driving the ridership on six? Well, well what's what's really driving the ridership is a lot in the north-south alignment, uh, the St. Mary's Navarro core of downtown, where a lot of the employment is is they based. All had that, they, they all have that. So, um, the the increment. The question is, what's driving six versus the other three alternatives to have the highest ridership? What's driving six is the additional length along West Cesar Chavez. And as you can see, it's, it's an incremental difference of about, I think it's 22,000. It's 200,000 annually. Yeah. Might I also suggest something? That you also have on the eastern end, you would have, by the completion of the streetcar, you would have 2,500 housing units in Hemisphere, and you would have a 1,000 uh, to the south on Cesar Chavez. And also, contingent upon what the city does, uh, it would go past a potential site for the grocery uh, store, which would, and, and the, depending on what happens in Univision, 
uh, and the conversion of that to housing as well, you'd have that, and it includes the Mercado area, which we've had heard testimony on today. Is that all factored into your calculation with Dr. Gambetta suggesting? So it's not. Can you go back to five again, please? So you, it, it really is then related to the additional amount of track we have then, for the most part? Okay. Right. In fact, if you go back to the slide that compares operating cost and ridership, go back to that slide. It's a lot more cost. Yep. Yeah, you can see yeah. with, with, with the cost. With, yeah, you have a lot more. The cost is directly sure. related to the amount of service. And so you can see the more service you put out, the more ridership you have. So if you want to try and normalize it by like taking the cost and dividing it by ridership or whatever, you'll find that option seven has the like lowest average cost per rider. Yes. Yeah, I, there's a lot of this I just am and trying to understand. Can I ask one more? Yeah, just one more question. So on the ridership, um, again, with that kind of convoluted way you go from seven to eight, stays pretty consistent. I, I'm surprised that seven wouldn't have a higher ridership with a sort of direct east-west picking up the convention center at one end and market square at the other that you know we've heard a lot of comments right on tonight. It, and actually can we go to the number seven one of the benefits of alternative seven that is reflected here is that we have basically a double headway that's occurring in the core of downtown along st mary's navarro um, and so I'm sorry, not on seven. Uh, seven, basically, you have just a crossing. So 10 minute headways, basically. Mm -hmm. We'll throw it up here. Here we go. Alternative five is where we have the east-west alignment pumping down St. Mary's Navarro and the north-south alignment pumping down. So you really have a five minute uh, headway picking up the core of downtown. So that frequent service is increasing a lot more of the ridership on alternative five. Thank you. I might just uh, have the board reflect upon also it isn't simply a matter of ridership but also on who is riding uh, and whether it is and who, who, who the uh, target ridership is aimed at uh, in other words whether it would be residents or whether it would be commuters or whether it would be tourists and so on so that that's a that's a part of the of the calculus as well well I am interested in that so help me understand Brian where the ridership numbers come from in this I, th I think I understand the issue of more track sure. more riders but what I don't understand in this is what you're connecting yeah, the, because the there are certain routes that seem like they're connecting more sure and I don't understand why the ridership numbers don't reflect the connections between these places so and then I would like to understand to to dr. Gambetta's point the ridership matrix of what you're looking at tourists versus uh, residents so and I have a third question which is how do you factor in the what happens after you build it I, I'd like to start with the last one because I, I think that's important because major capital improvement projects such as transit or streetcar or anything create destinations and create modes and movements through the through the city the models tend to not necessarily reflect those well. Um, so what I would say about what the numbers you're seeing up here is that they are all comparable. They're all within the same realm. There is not one that is generally way lower or way higher. And the, the ridership the, is, is being done with the model that is done um, through the MPO um, with some tweaks to it. We've, we've introduced some of the, the new um, data, census data, We've looked at some of the proposed um, buildings and development, but it has to kind of be on the books, sort of, kind of, and not necessarily in the, I think I'm going to build that type of phase. Um, so the ridership numbers are a lot of art associated with this. And I think Jeff, um, Mr. Arndt, um, laid it out correctly. If you look at, you got to look at how much you're building also, because how much you build also drives how much ridership you get. Um, um, so to say so the longer route in this case is generating a little bit longer a l larger ridership so I think before uh, you move to the, the next sure, item sure. Mr. Buchanan if I, if I might 
the one thing that's disappeared is that component of economic development uh, from the east-west route. And I want to emphasize the potentiality for economic, uh, for inducing as being a stimulus for economic development and to take into consideration the lines uh, on, on the, the four under consideration of new economic development or enhanced economic development along the uh, alignments that are currently under consideration. And I think that that's an exceptionally important variable. Um, I would uh, agree, Dr. Gambetta, um, economic development is obviously uh, a tool here that streetcar is used for. Um, there are two kinds of economic development. One is basically taking underutilized land and creating something new with the development. So that's one type of development. Another type of development would be taking existing parcels or existing land that's vacant or underutilized or has a high vacancy rate and actually putting people in there because of streetcar. I think market and commerce has a, a lot of the latter type of conversation, maybe some vacant buildings or that have some higher and better uses, some high rises that are in a general area that may have some vacancy rates that maybe streetcar can help bring down those vacancy rates as part of that development. So it's a balance between new versus utilizing existing and bringing that development up and, the, and that core up. So it's just a balance between the two a, as we move forward, so. To be continued. Yes. Absolutely. I, I still have quite. You didn't finish for me. He's, he's going to go back. <laughs> you only answered one of my questions. The other one was who's writing it? Yeah, what kind of, what is the ridership matrix? And then where did the ridership numbers come from? Sure. Jason, do you want to handle the ridership? And then I have another one for you. <laughs> the ridership numbers actually came from our onboard survey. That's the basis for how people are using our services and traveling from zone to zone. Basically, downtown is split up into several different zones, and how people go from one to the other is what, what's been measured um, on how our service works. So we use that, and then we also, of course, as Brian mentioned, had 2020 projections that include some of this growth that happens in various zones, and that takes into account um, sort of how we get to a number. And of course, an increased headway, as Kyle mentioned, an increased frequency will make it more attractive. Do, yeah, do you consider, in relation to your question, yeah. do you consider um, the potential new choice riders that currently might not ride a bus that would ride streetcar in your projections? A actually, there is not a bias currently interjected into these numbers. So that's certainly something as we move forward that we'll, we'll see. Now, is, is, isn't that, I mean, tell me, I might be wrong, but isn't that typically what happens when you introduce that is been, rail, you pick that's up a been lot observed of choice over and over. It's been observed over and over. Yeah, which yes. helps with congestion and traffic and a lot of other issues. Absolutely. So we're going to get that. We're going to get that part of this matrix at some before we're asked to make a final decision. That's something that we'll definitely uh, no before work on we make a decision. Yes. Th that's not really a question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hom, I guess part of that for me is uh, how do you, uh, right now we have everything on the table, right? So this is an operations question. This anticipates that all of our existing, if, let me see if I understand it correctly. All of our existing buses are operating the way they've been operating. Via Primo is in operation and we're overlaying the streetcar onto it. At some point, are you going to tell us, and do the ridership numbers get affected by removing a percentage of the transfers in downtown? I mean, how does that get impacted by this, or, or does it? Is that a question for you, or for, I don't know who, whoever wants to answer that, whoever has that information. Maybe it's an operation. I'm going to ask Keith Hom. How does that happen? Normally, once they choose a route, then we can determine what the bus service is going to look like around it. And actually, we're going to start, we already have started looking at uh, various ways to change the bus network so that it can connect better with these different streetcar alternatives. So 
once we do that and once the board narrows down to an alternative we'll be able to i would presume you can incorporate the ridership changes due to the bus changes so yes. there'll be some restructuring of that some restructuring of the transfer uh, situation in downtown that will relate to some percentage then why on this matrix is there a difference in connect with bus we're going to drive that no matter what we do right so that's not really is that accurate or not accurate where did that come from I mean if I understand the system the way you all have been explaining it to me right there's a west an east and a middle and the connections happen in those three places and that's going to happen no matter where which route we choose am I wrong no, that, that's accurate and and really this ridership does take into account this assumption of um, re restructuring bus routes mm -hmm. so actually what this is doing is creating several opportunities more opportunities I guess for uh, people to transfer between our services um, by taking a lot of that bus service off of commerce and market there's fewer opportunities along commerce and market to transfer so that's really what's being shown here but um, if we go back to the way we originally explained sort of the analysis, there are a set of these. But that you can all be had mediated. told us at one point that the optimum transfer part of this was, I'm just let me see if I understand mm -hmm. this, was you have people on corners <coughs> and they're on a day like today, it's hot. And you have senior citizens out there. We don't have adequate facilities, right? And so part of this was the next thing we were supposed to consider was that we had people at the West Side multimodal in air conditioning and adequate facilities. We have people on the east side in adequate facilities like we are doing in other places. And then ultimately somewhere in the middle, I don't know where, that was supposed to occur too. Wasn't that where we're supposed mm -hmm. to be going? Yes. Okay. It's the North District hub concept that we had talked about. So the, I don't understand the, the, why we're, I still don't get, maybe what I'm getting to is I, I really didn't, I think maybe in order to, to accurately assess this, we need to think about what does service look like after you choose. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think that's fair, for example, like what you're telling me. I don't get it. I, I've. And it also was not to displace the circulator. Uh, which we had was not to duplicate uh, and, and then there's duplication <laughs> and we don't understand that either yet and we, I, I don't understand your evaluation matrix yet I have a, it has a lot of holes <laughs> for me well I appreciate that and I think we'll have to do a better job the 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 thing that I think that is highlighting this, and Brian alluded to this, is that what we've tried to do is enhance the performance of every one of these alternatives. There's not a lot of differences. And so one of the things that I, I talk about, the, the end result we have is a locally preferred alternative. It is just that. We're not going to come up, we're finding there's not one that's going to stand out as the best and only alternative we need to pick with. So uh, Well, there is one. It's the north south, and the north question south for you right. is: you're, yeah. No, you're wrong. There is one. It's the <laughs> north south. That is emerging very consistent. I would agree with you on that. And the question for me is: the methodology for pursuing the funding of the north south versus an east west. Right. Right. Good point. I, th I think that as we go through the the rest of the presentation, we're going to find some of these conversations come back. <laughs> that there is let me let me finish that you bet is it possible that there is in getting to a locally preferred alternative that there's a different you're dealing with the criteria differently or there's a different set of criteria or a different weighting of the criteria to on a north south versus an east west we can certainly look at that and I, I think that what what not redoing all of the information but no, you don't need some different you don't necessarily need to look at it we need to look at it. <laughs> yeah, that there is that ridership and right has is overlaid onto a route in one way, right. and then the potential for 
service and who you serve and what the economic development potential is needs to be looked at a different way. Yeah, I would, I would route. characterize it as a different lens now that we're starting to see results. We, we can actually look at it from two or three different perspectives. So this suggestion that you have is a very good one that we need to consider. Let's go ahead, and, and I'm sure that we'll, we'll have a couple of these others, other comments come back to us for a little bit additional dis discussion. There were five specific uh, board questions that came up in our last meeting a month ago, and you'll see them highlighted here. We're going to address each one of these questions as, as briefly as possible, but I also want to do it fully. Uh, so uh, the first question that we uh, fielded from you was a question of taking a look along the economic development lines of what is the, appra the appraised value of properties. Uh, and, and we took this very simply. We don't have a lot of conclusions on this, but it's information that we want to make sure that we bring forward for your consideration. And there's three slides that I want to present on this topic. The first thing we did was we looked at the appraisal district information and we looked at uh, essentially all five of the alternatives and we said what is the assessed value of investment that has already occurred in the, in the downtown San Antonio area. And as you can see, each one of these has a different number as well as a total as well as a per track mile. I want to bring your attention to alternative seven and eight. Alternative seven and eight, of course, are along market and commerce. And as you can see, the value of investment that is out there right now is substantially more, uh, about 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent more or greater than the other alternatives, which are largely focused on uh, the east-west of Martin Pecan and, and Cesar Chavez. So that's something that we wanted to kind of bring forward. Now we broke that down just a little bit further for you as well. We looked west of St. Mary's along Martin, along Commerce, and along Chavez. And again, this, uh, this is fairly telling that Commerce is substantially greater in terms of the investment value that's out there today at 470 million total. Martin has a pretty healthy investment in the 340 range, and then Chavez is less than that. Is that a differential? Is that number? Sorry. Okay, just looking at Chavez so I understand that. Is that a reflection of the public held nature of that property? Yes. Okay, so um. are you all going to go, or who goes to the to end, not just the public entities, but I guess there needs to be some understanding in, in order to determine economic development potential of, of these routes. I'm not picking on anybody, but let me just see. If, if a school district, for example, held a lot of land along a route, mm -hmm. what is their um, feeling about allowing that property to be developed? as opposed to continuing to house the function that it houses today. Or if the city or the county held a significant amount of land along a route, what would they do with it? And in the same vein, w what is the attitude of, of a private landowner toward development? I think we need to begin to understand that too. I don't know whether you all are doing focus groups with landowners along these routes. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I do see what you're saying, Chairman. Um, we have had several meetings with stakeholders along the alignment, um, whether or not they be public, private, or and to just get a sense of what the ideas are along the alignment. I think the challenge for staff is to put down on paper what somebody thinks they want to do with their property and a value associated with that and make sure that that is fair to another group that may not know that. So we came up with a concept of just looking at gross acres and the ability for that to have a higher and better use. And that is what we did as part of our economic development portion of at this level. Now what I would suggest as we move through the different alignments and we do get a locally preferred alternative, we go ahead and do a full blown economic development potential of that particular route. Yeah. And uh, in, in, could I ask on this, this is basically factoring out the north-south al alignment, correct? Is that fair? And uh, the other aspect besides the public 
all of these have public uh, 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 land involved. Uh, part of it is also the undeveloped nature of components along Chavez, right? with a even though in private hands, with potentiality for development. I, w I would agree with that. And, and I would piggyback on to Brian's comment is that my experience has been once you have a project, an LPA, then your, your economic development strategy is just as you laid out, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, which is to actually enter into those discussions with the city and the property owners or the public owners of that property to see if there are improvements that they would be interested in willing to advance. What out of the out of these routes, right, the ones that are you know under consideration, do they have uh, public improvement districts or terses that overlay them in any way, in part? Actually, uh, the majority of almost every alternative has a ters of one sort or another um, that it is in. Touches it. Yes. Um, and then the the public improvement district of downtown gets a pretty large chunk of the middle of each alternative. And of course, it's really not, by the nature of, of the shape of it, it's really not much different from one to the other because the boundary extends from one to the other. So. Um, to wrap this, this item up, we did also look at the area east of St. Mary's. And this is where you find a much more striking uh, difference here. And there's two, two real big issues, and we've pointed out the first one. The Chavez section east of St. Mary's has a very significant amount of public land holdings, Hemisphere Park, uh, and whatnot. So you see a substantially decreased uh, amount of investment that is there currently. The other part of uh, the commerce is this is really concentrated in one spot. This is the River Market Center and the three major hotels right around it have the vast majority of that value that's pieced there. Uh, but nonetheless, you do see, uh, again, I don't have any grand conclusions for you, but it's information for all of us to consider as we move forward about where is the potential for economic development, where is investment. And it goes back to what Brian said earlier. There's two different approaches. It's uh, enhancing existing development where it's not performing as well, uh, or it's brand new development uh, growing up from vacant land. Will, will the board, and having suggested this sort of uh, breakdown uh, in you know, a few weeks back, uh, are we going to get, as a board, a breakdown, just a printout, if we could, of the individual properties along particular alignments? Is that that doesn't seem a Herculean task. We can provide that to you. Yeah. I think that will allow us to, to look at it and to make an analysis of, the, of, uh, of existing and of potential uh, at this stage. Okay. That, keep that going. That's exactly how this was generated. Keep, off of, off keep, going. keep going. I, I'm, I, just, I need to get through an executive session item before 7.15. So. We'll move as quickly as we can. Second question you asked us was uh, the proximity of a stop location in front of the convention center. And again, this was that unintended consequence where we lost Alamo as an alignment. What we looked at here very quickly, I have just a couple of slides, is direct service to the new Market Street alignment that's being uh, constructed now uh, is not really feasible in, without the reconstruction of the street realignment that's underway. Now let me kind of orient you. I want, now I've said that. The top North, the top right entrance is the planned new main entrance to the co convention center. But there are three other entrances to the convention center as well. So what we wanted to be able to do is take a look at the distances to our planned project uh, and take a look at the walk distances to an entrance to get there. So you see that the two on the north, are, we'd basically have access to commerce. The two on the south would have access to the Chavez alignments. One key factor that I want to mention to you, though, is because of the new reconstruction, and Mr. Miller brought this up, we can't continue to go east uh, and get under uh, I-37. So we do have to maneuver our way. We're on a two-way pair along market commerce, but we have to go back up to commerce at Bowie in order to go under 37 on commerce. So that pushes our stations back to the far, the stop, back to uh, the left-hand column. 
so we're closer we're actually west of Bowie and then we have another station on the westbound movement that is uh, near the river market area did did you look at um, going market and the re and then coming down the reconstructed buoy to get to the Robert Thompson wouldn't I mean wouldn't that be a way again to get to Robert Thompson Yes, we, we did look at that. It does enter into the realm of the 2012 bond uh, consideration. Uh, there's substantial reconstruction that would be involved. Our conversation with city staff was uh, a less than lukewarm reception to tearing up that street uh, after they've rebuilt it. Um, there are some, uh, there is a challenge. It would make some sense, I would agree, but it does get us into uh, that issue that yeah, let's, We're all let's not with. let common sense ever stand in the way of anything. <laughs> um, so in terms of looking at those four entrances, we, we actually calculated the distance and the potential walk distance between the furthest stop for us, which is up, at, up on Commerce, to the main entrance actually is a longer walk than the other stops, even served by Cesar Chavez. So it ends up with about a three minute walk to the other from Cesar Chavez up to the southern entrances as well as uh, uh, about a five minute to the, the other area. Now, real quickly, what does three minutes mean? We took a look at other cities and how they are serving their convention center. And sometimes you can actually be too close to the front door. You have a lot of congestion problems, a lot of queuing problems. So every one of these cities we've highlighted has uh, um, provided access to their convention center. The only two that have really truly direct service are Dallas and Denver, where it's actually integrated into the facilities themselves. Most of the others are in the one and a half, two, three, even four minutes uh, walk. Um, I use an example of San Diego. It's right across the street, but by the time you actually walk to the corner, cross the corner, and come across, depending on where you are, it's either uh, a, a two to three minute walk to get there. That's not the, p the point for me is look how many of the major cities that are in our competitive set who connect to their convention center. Well, and I, I, I would believe, I would suggest that we do, uh, we would be able to serve them. The, not as directly as Denver and Dallas perhaps, but within the same amount of walk distance or walk time uh, as those other cities. And if you would go back to the previous slide, just quickly isn't the as far as urban planning isn't uh, the hemisphere uh, uh, park isn't that part of the plan was to have a flow from the convention center into that area in which case that would induce that flow even more so in looking at one of those alignments yes and, and, and it certainly it's it's one of the more pleasant walks that you'd have from a stop to a convention center of going through hemisphere park let me just ask a question about the complexities of the the market and buoy and commerce on this one. I, if you were holding this project back for light rail, which I guess people were thinking, well, I don't understand them given your matrix or given this complexity, how you would have dealt with it then. And if it worked for light rail and you're thinking, if you all were thinking, oh, that's the best corridor for light rail. What makes it different in this situation? Well, I think that's a great question. Uh, and as we are finding out more information, we're, we're reevaluating, you know, our position about that. Certainly the Market Street reconstruction does change a little bit of our thinking in that process. Um, we've even asked ourselves internally as to would we You mean the Market fact, Street reconstruction that's underway right now? Yes, sir. I mean, a year ago that was you know, very formative and, and hadn't hadn't been finalized at this point in time. So I just mentioned that we learn, learn new things every day uh, as we go through this. It would have made it very challenging and I still think that it, it has the opportunity, but um, uh, it, you asked of an excellent question. It does make it a, a challenge for us if we were to try to put light rail in this alignment. I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. The third question, somewhat related to this, this issue too, was the w we actually introduced this in, in a response to some of the questions about the convention center, how close we are, as well as to the gaps that we were, we were creating with uh, some of the areas. So we looked at the uh, walkability of these alternatives 
And what we are actually introducing here is the concept that you don't have to have front door service in order to be able to jump on the streetcar. And in fact, most times you are walking from some other place to get to the streetcar. So we've identified uh, the following uh, key locations in downtown. Uh, as you can see, we've, uh, and what we've taken is we've looked at the two alternatives, five and seven. So we took a look at alternative five, which of course is the Martin Pecan and Cesar Chavez, and we calculated the walk times to the nearest stop location. And as you can see, only two of those are greater than five minute walks. A five minute walk is a very standard, about a quarter mile uh, walk. And, but alternative five, we lose access to uh, close proximity access to the federal courthouse as well as to Ellis Alley. But all of the other areas are within a reasonable five minute walk. Alternative seven, on the other hand, that goes through uh, market commerce, we do lose uh, uh, the three areas, uh, especially that northwest area up along Martin Pecan. And that becomes uh, just a little bit outside of the five minute uh, walk that we were trying to, uh, to estimate. Again, no grand conclusion here, but it does indicate the kind of trade-offs that we are wrestling with of how well are we serving uh, within a five-minute walk, uh, five walk uh, some of the areas that uh, are in downtown. One of the other questions that we were asked to address was would commerce uh, and would it still allow us to create a loop very much like alternative six that we have there? Uh, and in fact, we've identified alternative seven and we've kind of dotted in what a potential loop might look like. So we've tried to replicate uh, the loop that uh, has been created in alternative six with uh, this particular alternative. And a couple of observations came up uh, for us uh, on this particular area. Number one, we don't feel that it precludes, that mar market commerce would preclude the creation of a loop. And that's hence we've dotted that in. However, we do feel that the, the proximity, the very close proximity of Martin Pecan to market commerce really, in fact, becomes competitive with each other. You're basically competing for the same riders for twice the investment. And so, again, this is that element of a reasonable five-minute walk introducing it that we feel that you could actually put too much investment to where you're not getting the per rider uh, benefit on the ridership side that you would like to achieve. But we did want to at least indicate a response to the question and uh, allow you to uh, comment on that if necessary. The fifth question that uh, we were asked that Mr. Miller made, made reference to was being able to extend east of the railroad tracks, <coughs> the UP main line, uh, if we were to go to Sunset Station along the market commerce alignment. Excuse me. Um, the first thing is uh, we wanted to highlight the importance uh, and of, of the UP main line. UP main line has about 24 track, uh, uh, trains a day. Uh, it is something that we would not be able to cross at grade. Um, we wouldn't have the UP's approval and even if we got past the UP, the FRA probably, well, they would not allow us to cross. Um, so we wanted to at least indicate that's our starting point with crossing uh, the railroad tracks at grade. Consequently, uh, if we were at Commerce, uh, we would have to, that's, we're saying that we can't cross there. Montana at the Robert Thompson Transit Center is an already constructed below grade separation. And so that has been our, our shooting point, our target uh, for the last year or more to be able to get across uh, the railroad track uh, area and continue to points east. It was also suggested that uh, we could go as far south as Durango, south of the Alamo Dome, and possibly go over the railroad on that structure. So very quickly, we wanted to uh, indicate um, a couple of quick, quick notes. This looks very confusing, and I'll see if I can kind of if you can follow the cursor on the screen. Basically, Sunset, if we are to continue east of Sunset, we have a couple of quick options. Number one, highlighted in green is the idea of a below grade separation under the railroad tracks. That is a real costly issue. It's something that we don't have in our budget right now, but it would be something that we'd have to look at. That's a possibility. The other possibility is that we actually loop around it. 
And the idea is we come down Commerce, we run south along Hofchen, and we're back to the Montana grade separation uh, where we are at uh, along Montana for the Robert Thompson Transit Center. And then of course, if we were to continue on Commerce, we come back up to Commerce and over. That represents about a quarter mile of track just to be able to get under the railroad, get around the railroad track, so to speak. Um, Thompson, if we serve Robert Thompson, if we get to Robert Thompson through the de detour here, uh, then it's ready for uh, our extension to the east. The other option that we just wanted to mention again is if we came extended Chavez East to use the Durango Bridge, it's about a one mile extra track for us to come along Chavez uh, and to go use that structure and then to come up on Cherry and head further east. The big caveat there is we have not done a bridge analysis. We don't know if that bridge would be able to uh, stand the loads of, of the uh, uh, tracks itself. And so we may have to reconstruct that bridge. So this is one of the, the, the team's big worries uh, about being able to move east. We share your concerns as well. That that's one of the, the challenges of being able to extend along market commerce and, and still continue to service uh, to the eastern part of the city. Or, or the other option, just to repeat Terminate. myself, is if you were able to keep going down market, took a ride on Bowie, Montana, yes. you would save some track there actually by doing that. I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the attitude actually on that one because to me, okay, I, when I look at this, it's the same thing as putting streetcar someplace else down Martin or any place else or the problems that you'll face on the west side too, the issues you'll face on the west side. But where you put it, economic development is going to flow, <laughs> right? Oh, I, I, I think intent. it has that potential, so yes. You have, a, you have a simple grade separation issue which will require money to deal with and it happens all over the country <laughs> and you just have to find the money to deal with it. I'd agree with you. Right, but you have several solutions that will work and where the track goes, things will happen. Thank you. Good point. So that brings us to our last slide. And the idea here is that, again, we wanted to make sure we responded to your questions. We presented to you the results of the market, uh, market commerce analysis at this point. Tonight, here we are presenting that information to you. We have a public meeting a week from tonight to be able to present the same results uh, of the market commerce information to the public. And then we plan on being back uh, tentatively. Uh, could, could occur around the PPD uh, board meeting or, or a special board meeting that Jeff is working on. The idea is that though by the middle of August, we'd, we want to be able to convene you, uh, be able to present our staff recommendations. I, I think we're going to look at the schedule and get back to you. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Okay. okay, the time is now 7.07 .07 and the Via Metropolitan Transit <coughs> Board of Trustees will officially go into a closed executive session. The items we will discuss during this executive session are as follows. Item number nine, entitled Funding Request and Proposed Interlocal Agreement with the Cities of New Braunfels, Schertz, and Cibolo, which is an executive session item pursuant to the Texas Government Code Section 551.071 entitled Consultation with Attorney, and Item 10.A entitled Real Estate 819 West Laurel Street, Five Points Area Property, which is an executive session item pursuant to the Texas Government Code Section 551.071 entitled Consultation with Attorney, and Section 551.072 entitled Real Property, and Item 11, entitled Discussion and Possible Action Regarding President and CEO Agreement, which is an executive session item pursuant to the Texas Government Code, Section 551.071, entitled Consultation with Attorney, and Sections 551.074, entitled Personnel Matters, and Item Number 12, entitled Legal Briefing which is an executive session item pursuant to the Texas Government Code, Section 551.071, entitled Consultation with Attorney. All persons who are authorized to attend this executive session, please proceed to the small conference room. The time is now 7.43 and we are officially coming out of a closed executive session regarding agenda items number 9, 10A, 11, and 12. No deliberations of public policy or vote taking occurred during this executive session. 
We do have a motion, I think, from Mr. Martin related to item number nine. Do you want to, uh, who wants to help articulate that motion? This is regarding item number nine is regarding funding request and proposed interlocal agreement with the cities of New Brunfels, Schertz, and Cibolo. If I'm understanding this correctly, this motion would allow us to proceed with negotiations with the cities of New Braunfels, Schertz, and Cibolo to provide them with transit service. Uh, so we would direct staff to go ahead and complete those negotiations and bring them back to uh, to the board for approval. Do I have a motion, Mr. Martin? I'm so moved. You, you want me to make the motion? You make the motion. I would like to authorize the president and CEO to negotiate and execute an agreement with the cities of New Braunfels, Schertz, and Cibolo to support a continuation of existing public transportation. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Martin and a second by Mr. Miller. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. We skipped over item number five, which was our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? I have a motion to approve by Mr. Miller with a second by Mr. Martin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. The time is now 746. And uh, do I have a motion to adjourn this meeting of the VIA Board of Trustees? I have a motion by Mrs. Bersenio and a second by Mr. Martin. We stand adjourned. The time is now uh, 7.47 and we will call this meeting of the Board of the Advanced Transportation District to order. Are there any announcements, Mr. Arndt? No, sir. Item number three, which is our consent agenda. I have a motion for approval by Mr. Miller and a second by Mrs. Bersenio. All in favor? Item number four, do we have any legal briefings? I have no legal briefings. That brings us to item number five. Do I have a motion for adjournment of the ATD board? I have a motion and a second. We stand adjourned. <laughs>